Welcome to today's culinary seminar. My name is Chef Nick Gonring, and I have the privilege of giving you a tour of our most relevant research findings applicable for menus of today. So let's get started. As we look at our agenda, there are really only two parts, what goes into our research and the trends and menu opportunities highlighted from our research. To conclude this seminar, we will discuss culinary strategies built for change. This was the 18th year we've conducted our proprietary external research in the three largest trend driving cities in the US, which are New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. These cities incubate the ideas where trends start and influence chefs around the country. We seek out newly open restaurants here because in our experience, they're the ones that drive the next wave of innovation. But what's the process, you might be thinking? The vast majority of the year, we are carefully examining publications, digital newspapers, magazines, journals, and blogs that call out new restaurant openings. This includes things like Eater New York, LA, Chicago, Grub Street, New York Times, New York Magazine, Infatuation, just to name a few. We notate these restaurants and track their progress throughout the year. This becomes our target list. As we approach our annual research, we vet these targets out by visiting their websites, studying their menus, looking at their social media, and reading what reviews that are out there. Last year, we had just south of 500 targets, and our goal is to always select and visit 120 of them in a three-week period. The logistics of all of this is a ton of work with many obstacles, but our research is only as good as our preparations prior to. We spend five working days in each city with a week not traveling in between. Every restaurant we visit is solely for research and not for indulgence. We taste the vast majority of each menu, professionally photo each plate presentation, scan the menus at the table, as they often appear different than what's online, and talk to anyone and everyone who's willing to provide us any context about their cuisine. We take a copious amount of notes, uh, often looking for subtle inclusions of flavor, or texture, and garnishes that do not make the print of the menu. And this, to me, is one of the most important parts of our documentation, as it truly sets us apart from research companies in the industry. Most research companies use menu verbiage and sales algorithms to find the highest frequency of output. Most of the sales data is supported from national chains, and the results will only tell you what consumers purchase or what is trending today. We are the boots on the ground looking for what the trend is of tomorrow. And the only way to do that is by visiting these restaurants, tasting their cuisines, and grabbing that flavor memory. The following morning, after a day of research, we start the documentation process. The photos get edited, cropped, and colored, and we start building a deck of slides capturing each dish, tasted with the menu description, pricing, and collective notes. If we don't do this, everything gets lost in the sauce. After our research has concluded between all three cities, we take this deck back to home office, and we try to decipher what it all means. We're looking for patterns or common threads between East Coast, West Coast, and in between, and every year we discover something that has not been on our radar. These menu opportunities, or most often micro-trends, are what we take a position on from a culinary perspective. Once we have highlighted our discoveries, we begin creating resources to complement our findings. Every year we standardize over 200 recipes based on our research that are housed in a proprietary and internal system that our culinary, sales, and marketing teams utilize to consult with you, our customers, in commercial and non-commercial segments. Our research makes or breaks our entire year. The logistical planning of each city takes an immense amount of time. There are many factors. Since these are all new restaurants, some might be weeks old with limited information on how to contact them, what their hours are, what are their current menus, and they might not even have a phone number listed. There are numerous reservation platforms which require us to have multiple logins, as most reservation systems don't allow you to make eight dinner reservations for one day. And we create a Google map with each address, pin drop location, and try to efficiently fill our week. In New York, we Uber everywhere and take an occasional subway train to a specific stop. Timing is everything, and that is the hardest part of each day. We have to leave the hotel by a certain time, and we are walking or Ubering. If we're Ubering, we have to establish that ride by X time. It gets dicey. A few years ago, we got caught in a snowstorm in Brooklyn, and it was something like six inches in an hour, and we were gridlocked with cars for miles around us. One thing to note here are the boroughs and totals. For 18 years, we have only gone to Manhattan and Brooklyn, as that's where the biggest draw is. 
We never really go north past Midtown because it's too touristy and the vast majority of the new innovative restaurants are well below that mark. This last past year, we visited 41 restaurants and tasted 441 dishes in five days in New York City. And here are some places that we visited, as you can see the logos. On to the city of broad shoulders. Here we visited 39 restaurants and tasted 362 dishes. And some of the neighborhoods that we visited in Chicago, as you see the restaurants in front of you, Logan Square, Lincoln Park, Wrigley Field, all the way down to South Loop, a lot of different great neighborhoods in Chicago. In the City of Angels, we visited 35 restaurants and tasted 384 dishes. We visited these places in cities like Santa Monica, Hollywood, Silver Lake, Radio City, and Venice Beach. And here you can see some of the examples. But in total, for our 2020 research, we visited 115 restaurants and tasted 1,187 dishes in 15 working days. Let that sink in. That is a lot of data to arm ourselves with to show examples of what is truly the restaurant environment. Now onto the trends, enough about the process. Even though our research was conducted in pre-COVID times, it's important to note that the flavor is what drove the demand prior to. So now it's about finding that sweet spot on your menu that will also work for portable needs too. These trends and menu opportunities are specifically highlighted for this presentation to facilitate the needs of today. On to bone broths. We first called out bone broth as a growth opportunity back in 2015 after visiting pioneering chef Marco Canoro's humble Brodo takeout window in Manhattan's East Village. Today, Canora's Concepts has grown to five locations. Driven by the popularity of protein-centric diets such as paleo and keto, bone broths are carving out a growing niche both in new shops dedicated to broths and very many restaurants that incorporate bone broths into signature dishes that offer both heightened flavors and a healthy halo. So bone broths are really long simmered and reduced stocks that have been created with caramelized bones and vegetables to produce a lip-smacking broth. Consumers find the value in rich drinkable broths as it is rich in nutrients and vitamins. The concept in itself is prime for portability as the vast majority of the broths we tasted were in to-go coffee cups with a clutch and a lid. Not only do they offer that healthy halo, but chefs have been creative in adding flavor to them. Some of the concept we visited offer a a la carte stirring to bone broth bases, while other chefs heighten them on their menus as an ingredient. This is an example from Sibling Rivalry in Los Angeles, and this is a health-driven concept. So here they have their chicken bone broth with turmeric, ginger, and then they have a really nice sachet of herbs on the side that you can stir that bone broth into and add that aromatic to. Now onto Spring Bone Kitchen in New York City. This is a menu from their establishment that we visited. And if you look at it, it's really interesting because for one, they're calling out free range chicken broth, grass fed beef broth, so some really strong marketing there. And then they also add broth as flights as an option to purchase. And they're saying that bone broth is an ingredient in the menu description. And then if you look at the a la carte add-ins, I think that's really interesting. So it's all health and flavor driven, which allows for customization, which equates for you higher profits and then customer satisfaction. And then at Springbone Kitchen, here's another example of health driven. So this is their immunity broth, classic chicken broth with garlic and ginger and vitamin C. And as you can see, it's in a to-go coffee cup with that clutch on the side. Additionally, at Springbone Kitchen, this is their liquid gold. So chicken broth with coconut milk and turmeric. And I think you could actually add something to this and do more of a golden milk latte, if you will, with bone broth by adding some warming spices and putting it in a blender. On to flora fauna in Chicago, this is really bone broth as an ingredient. So they're using something really unique here, and this is their farm stone bowl. So after talking to the chef, here they take all their byproduct from butchering uh, subprimals in the back of the house, all their scrap and bone to make this delicious and rich three bone bone broth. So they're taking skirt steak and pork belly and chicken thighs and really making this a craveable farm stone bowl. They add panela cheese, which really doesn't melt well and kind of gives you a texture of tofu and then a bunch of different vegetables. So this is really, really hearty. And they're getting $38 for this. So they're really, really making a good profit margin on it. I think this is a good opportunity for a to-go kit as well in your restaurant. And then another example as an ingredient, this is from Electric Lemon uh, in New York in the Hudson Yards in the Equinox Hotel. This is their duck dumpling dish. So spoon tender duck dumplings. Uh, they're slow cooked, 
They're served with lemon verbena and fermented apples. And then the server comes by table side and pours a fortified serving of duck bone broth to really round out the dish. And lastly, this is just planting a seed of an idea back at Springbone Kitchen. This is their butter coffee. So here they're adding grass-fed butter, MCT oil, and unsweetened almond milk and putting it into a blender. This is really a riff off of David Asprey's Bullet Coffee that was created in LA about a half a decade ago. But what we're thinking is, hey, why can't you add bone broth instead of coffee and put that in a blender? This could be another incremental sale and a new idea. On to conservas. So freshly preserved seafood. Most Americans hold the general perception that canned seafood is nasty, or at least of inferior quality. Some hold this association from wartime stories of the past, where tinned seafood was rationed to soldiers, or a basement bunker that was filled with shelf-stable canned goods as a preparatory survival measure. However, tinned fish, which are called conservas in Europe, offer an array of highly craveable flavors. Family-run canneries, artists and producers offer premium seafood that is harvested at its prime, cooked delicately to perfection, and then freshly preserved in shelf-stable tins. In Europe, conservas have been a mainstream staple on restaurant menus for decades, and now American dining consumers are starting to embrace them as the charcuterie of the sea. What you see here is the cover from the 1998 Beastie Boys album, Hello Nasty, which shows the group packed like a tin can of sardines. But what we are reiterating here is that they are nasty no more. Conservas are delicious. Mostly imported from Spain and thus a staple on tapas menus, there is a wide variety of seafood tinned and freshly preserved, from scallops to sardines to baby squid and tuna. As a shelf stable item, they are perfect for portable sea couterie kits or a grocerant setup offering goods for sale that coincide with your menu. They have unparalleled flavor and craveable umami. You can use it straight out of the can or as an ingredient. This first example is from Wherewithal in Chicago, and this is their sardinas and salsa. So sardines that have been chopped up with some roasted chilies, and here they're just opening up the can and serving it with some crusty bread, which is in a different photo, but you get the idea. The next slide, the Jones from New York City, restaurateur Gabe Stolman. This is his tinned sardines with some salted butter, some baguette, and a lemon cheek on the side. Super simple, right? No labor involved whatsoever here. It's just plugging and playing. At Otonio in Los Angeles, a tapas restaurant from Patricia Mentano, this is their cebola and escabeche. So they have a variety here of house-made and purchased conservas. In the back, they have pearl onion confit with nori and onion ash. They have their house-cured Hope Ranch mussels. In the front, they have their baby squid. In the middle, sardines, and then tuna belly on the right. This is all meant to share as a tapas style and then have some crusty bread, some other ingredients like pickles and so forth. It's a great thing to share. And then at Young American in Chicago, this is their smoked clam dip. Again, this is another house example. So they're curing manila clams, they're smoking them, they're adding it to a dip with creme fraiche and some Montreal spices. And then they're serving with some toasted points of nori and some crusty bread on the side for dipping. And at Perea in Chicago, a modern Korean and American concept, this is their sardine conserva dish. And really what they're doing is they're encouraging you to take that flash fried nori wrap in the back, grab some sardines in the middle, put in that wrap almost like a handheld, and then grab some of the pickles in the front. They've got pickled radish and pickled kimchi, and just making it almost like a mini taco and taking one and passing it around for people to enjoy. At Mercadito Little Spain in New York City, this is in the Hudson Yards development. This is Chef Jose Andres' restaurant. This is his conserva called Ensalada de la Rusa. And basically, it's just a whimsical play on a tuna salad that we're all familiar with. He's taking potatoes and conserved tuna that's really, really high end from Spain, some carrots, peas, and mayonnaise that we're all accustomed to seeing, and mixing it all together, and then serving it on a plate with some crusty breadsticks that have been vertically placed, which is an awesome garnish and an awesome texture. On to handmade pastas, and they're taking over. Handmade pastas are both profitable and portable. So both win-wins for our current times. You have the opportunity to create differentiation with the pastas you create by adding unique ingredients, unique twists, and global mashups to the pastas that most people don't serve nearby. Global pastas are very on trend right now. And what I mean by that are Italian shapes, but with global flavors and influence and not being strictly Italian. We've seen menus across the country adapting to having categories of pasta on their menu that are not Italian by any stretch of imagination. 
but they're adding these categories for a reason because they are profitable and enticing and recognizable, which for these times is very important. This first example is from Yours Truly, and this is a play on carbonara, which I love. So here they're adding some color to the, the shells of the pasta with squid ink, but instead of adding a regular hen egg or a chicken egg on top, which carbonara normally would have, here they're adding seafood eggs. So they're adding uni or sea urchin roe, trout roe, batargo, which is shaved mullet roe, and chipotle butter. So really a mashed up version of carbonara. So talk about differentiation on a menu here. Then a good fortune in Chicago, another example of adding color and vibrancy to that pasta dough. Here they're adding black garlic to it to make the rigatoni. So they're adding some rutabaga, some smoked maitake mushroom conserva, and pepitas for texture. Then at Don Angie in New York City in Greenwich Village, the chefs here are taking lasagna, which is super approachable and recognizable, but making it slightly different, and that's the draw here. So instead of making a layered lasagna, they're making pinwheels and adding some unique ingredients, a unique twist. They're adding raviola cheese, a uh, different bechamel, a bolognese with veal and Italian sausage, and really makes this dish highly craveable. Also at Don Angie, here's a play on soprasini with smoked mussels. So they're adding peroni to the cooking process. They're adding macho and butter toasted breadcrumbs for texture, just completely unique. Then at restaurant Nightshade in Los Angeles, this is their squid ink tagliatelle. So they're adding the squid ink to the pasta dough to make it black, but they're adding cuttlefish into what they're calling bolognese, which is incredible. So instead of adding sausage or different meat components to their sauce, they're adding the fish back in to the bolognese to make a seafood bolognese. And then they're finishing it with gojujang, the Korean fermented chili paste, a little bit of shiso leaf, lemon oil, and Parmesan. So this is a completely mashed up version of tagliatelle and bolognese, which again, draws that differentiation and fetches a higher profit margin for you. Then a restaurant Black Ship, Chef Kaichi Kurobi's restaurant. This is an Italian-Japanese mashup. And here they're doing udon noodles with table side service of miso cream, a little bit of yuzu pickles, shiitake mushrooms, and some roasted chicken. Just a delicious dish. So on to rice cakes. Say the word rice cakes, and most consumers think of the crunchy rice rounds found in the grocery snack aisles. However, we're talking about the Korean staple in this case. We first discovered rice cakes in our research many years ago in the early days of Momofuku Sambar by world-renowned chef David Chang in New York City. His spicy pork and rice cake dish is the only original menu item that still exists today. Korean rice cakes are made of steamed rice flour that is pounded and formed into cylindrical sticks or larger rounds that are cut into slices or bias cuts. While a few chefs insist on making their own from scratch, pre-made rice cakes are readily available for food service, usually frozen and only requiring a quick soak or simmer in water to ready them for a dish. Rice cakes that have been soaked or simmered have a soft texture akin to a very dense marshmallow. Many chefs serve them this way, but in the best dishes we sampled, the extra step was taken to sear or pan fry the rice cakes in oil, creating a crispy crust that produces a very desirable and textural counterpoint to the soft interior. Let's look at some of the best examples. So this is restaurant Zhang in Chicago, and this is their Tiokbuki. This is a classic Korean dish, and this is usually how it's prepared and served. So what they have is the rice sticks in the four, but they have the Korean barbecue sauce down in the bottom, some pickled mustard seeds, some charred cabbage, and then a six minute egg. And again, this is a very typical way to create rice cakes in Korea, but let's look at some different examples of how it's modernly interpreted. Now, as we say in our research process, when we find something that, be that becomes mashed up in a sense, we know we're on the right track to finding something that is new, that is on trend. So here, this is restaurant Windrose in New York City, and this is their truffle teak and cheese. This is a play on mac and cheese. So here they have their, what they're calling rice gnocchi or their rice sticks, their rice cakes. And they have their cheese bechamel, a little bit of Korean chili powder, and then rice, and then pork rind crumbles on top for texture. This is restaurant Hanyeo in Brooklyn, a Korean American restaurant, and this is their fundido, a totally mashed up version. So here you have your spicy and saucy rice cakes with the fundido sauce, and then on top, They've got the cheese that's caramelized uh, under a broiler with the rice cakes in between. So you get a textural difference of both the rice cakes that are chewy in the sauce and then that caramelized cheese on top, a super delicious dish. And then a jungle bird in New York City. This is their crispy rice cakes and this is just how we like them. Crispy exterior, a little bit of a chewy soft interior 
And here they have the gojujang chili paste that's sauced around it, some pickled sweet chilies, sesame seeds, and scallions, a really delicious snack. And then on to Kaui. Again, David Chang, this is his newest restaurant in the Momofuku Empire in the Hudson Yards District. And here they're doing a rice cake that they make in-house. They prepare it into a round. They give it a good pan sear. They add some Benton's ham on top, so some really good country cured ham from the U.S., some chili jam, uh, furikake with some seaweed elements to it, and some uh, inori, and then some fried shallots for texture as well. So this, is di this dish was just beyond uh, anything that we've tasted prior. And they did this table side by cutting it with a very large shears. Uh, Kawi is Korean for scissors, apparently, and had it served this way. A really delicious dish, an outstanding presentation. On to salads. Salads, time and time again, keep on innovating. So amidst the ever so conscious, healthy-minded consumer, we've seen salad renditions with high levels of innovation. Chefs have been particular in selecting the varieties of lettuces, and greens while adding vibrant pots of color, unique garnishes, and textural stir-ins and pickles. So as you see, cross-utilization is a huge opportunity for salads. So look at your larder in the back of the house. You have an opportunity to use what you have and create something basically out of nothing. You can create pickles and textural stir-ins, garnishes, and a drop of a hat with ingredients you probably already have. And salads don't have to be just greens. They can be grains and legumes. They can be chilled vegetables with fruits and so on. And obviously salads are great for portability. Bowls and to-go setups, I mean, they are ripe for this. And one thing that we saw in research was new renditions of Caesar salad. So your retro modern uh, dish now with anchovies and other accompaniments that we haven't seen previously. So a restaurant bandit in Chicago, this is their kale Caesar. Super great uh, rendition of a Caesar salad here. So obviously you've got the kale in the four but they have candied lemon on there, some Parmesan breadcrumbs for textural components, some purple endive for bitterness, and then a sieved egg uh, through a china cap just for a dusting of that hard cooked egg that comes into the texture and a stir in with the sauce or the, the dressing. So really delicious kale Caesar salad. And then Ada May in Los Angeles, this is their autumn cabbage salad, which I love. So as we approach fall, think about using this variety or different sorts of cabbages and chicories into something like this. So they're taking some of the cabbages, they're roasting it, chilling it down, adding some raw shaved, and then some Brussels sprouts, part of that same family, and then some yogurt vinaigrette on top to toss it all in with some sunflower seeds for texture. Just simply a delicious uh, salad to have. And then at Christmas in New York City, this is a Filipino restaurant, and we have only so much time for the trends that we're talking about today, but Filipino was by far a very large uh, piece of the research that we saw this year, and there's lots of things to report on there. But this is their rendition of a Caesar salad, their Pinroy Caesar. And what the difference here is outside of what you see visually is the two yield flakes that go on top. It's the crunchy component that you see looks a little darker and red. And that is herring that has been marinated and crisped up. And that is their play of taking the anchovy out of the Caesar dressing and adding the two yield flakes on top to give you that umami boost and that flavor that we're all familiar with. So I thought this was really genius. This is the Solterito salad from Amaru in Chicago. And what I liked about this is you don't see any lettuce at all. This is just grains, legumes, uh, cheese, and so forth. So you have edamame, you've got some queso fresco, some puff quinoa for texture, some pumpkin seeds, and a champagne vinaigrette all to toss this all in and bring it all together. And if you look at it, it's just a visually stunning salad. Super delicious, and again, no greens at all. And lastly, at Althea, Chef Matt Kenny's restaurant in Chicago. This is a vegan-only restaurant, and I was blown away by his cuisine and he's noted as such to do that. But this is his little gem salad, which again is actually a play on a Caesar salad. And what he's doing here is taking little gem, which is uh, a green between romaine and Boston bib lettuce, and he is adding sea beans for just a little bit of salinity, which is a sea vegetable, and dulse, which is another seaweed component, with hemp seeds for texture, sunflower dressing, and capers for more salty and brininess. But the, the sea vegetable here is the component that drives that umami flavor to replace that anchovy and make it vegan. So I thought this was a really cool way and a unique way to express that Caesar style salad. And you're gonna see a lot of sea vegetables in the future, I promise you. On to skewers, pick your weapon. So this is a ripe uh, opportunity for mashing, quick ticket times and so forth. And this is just a complete blank canvas. If you can put it on a stick, it's an opportunity for a sale, right? Skewers are portable, a place to cross utilize ingredients on your menu, and it is an easy place to find a category to fit it into. 
And as you look at skewers, there are all different sorts of world of flavors here. Anything from traditional barbecue, regionally speaking, Filipino, Cuban, Middle Eastern, Peruvian, you name it, right? And then different styles from kebabs to pinchos to antecuchos to kofta to satays. And they're completely versatile. So there's limitless opportunities here to put anything you want on a stick from plants to proteins. It's portable, you can walk down the street and eat it. You can put it in to go and take it with you. And there's all sorts of opportunity for mashups. So again, look at the larder of what you have on your menu already and turn it into something interesting and put it on a stick. Let's look at some examples. So at restaurant Mason Yaki in, in Brooklyn, this is a skewer basic restaurant. So everything they're serving basically is on a skewer here and everything is a mashed up rendition of French meets Japanese. Everything's a la carte, buy it by the each. And here they're doing a plain duck a l'orange. So they have the ground duck, they're putting on a skewer, putting a nice sear on it. And here they're placing it in some canard jus or duck jus. And they have reconstituted orange as a sphere that mimics what an egg yolk would look like, which I think is a fun play. And just a delicious dish to, you know, to eat and to enjoy and also a great portability option as well. At Bai and Co in Chicago, this is a Filipino Cuban mashup of all things. And this is a barbecue pincho. And here they're taking pork shoulder that's been braised, uh, throwing it on a really hot uh, surface to sear it up and get a crispy exterior. And then they're adding cola glaze and sesame seeds and green onions. And this is really, really delicious, lip smackingly good. On to Cabra, Chef Stephanie Eisard's restaurant, newest restaurant in the Hoxton Hotel in Chicago. This is her chorizo anticuchos. So they're taking amarillo mayo, serrano chili, cilantro, and scallion, putting it on a griddle and serving it right on a stick. Super delicious and super simplistic. Chorizo you can buy already, just cut it up into a little format like that, and place everything right on the skewer. Then at Savita in New York City, this is an example of a fish kebab with Mediterranean influence or Middle Eastern influence. And here they're taking grilled tuna, right? So you can't really see it visually in this picture, but I promise you, when you bite into it, the tuna is still rare, which I think is super unique. And they're serving with some lemon zest, a little bit of citrus, right? Red chili flakes uh, and olive oil. Simplistic and delicious. And that garnish of that charred lemon on the side to squeeze over it, just a really, really great example of an awesome garnish that's functional. At restaurant La Ventura in New York, this is their jerk sunchoke kebab. So they're roasting sunchokes with uh, a little bit of jerk seasoning on top of it. They're serving it with that Navajo fry bread, which is a really unique mashup there. And then adding refried lentils and tomatillo salsa on this side for dipping. Just a really unique plant-based skewer to, to have as an option. And back at Flore in New York City, this is their merguez skewer. And so they're taking their Middle Eastern and African spice blend, adding it to their ground lamb, throwing it on a skewer, grilling it, serving with some crushed chickpeas, some roasted red peppers. You've got Preserve lemons in there for brightness and some salinity, and then some cucumber and yogurt with mint, which gives it that really nice freshness as well. Back at Mason Yaki, here's their scallop and Maltese. So their French influence again coming in with that blood orange hollandaise on that skewer of that scallop, really interesting and a good one-two biter. And then back again, here they are with their chicken breast and sauce allemande. So they've got sweet potato puree with lime and miso in there. That's kind of their Japanese play meets French with that sauce of the allemande and chicken. Really unique play to dip that in with the, the sweet potato puree and have a great bite. And then Ada May in Los Angeles, this is more of a large format, but certainly you could do it on a smaller level. And this is their uh, al pastor mushroom kebab. So the usual suspects here of the achiote paste, making that red exterior of the mushroom. But they're adding this Middle Eastern influence, which they're known for, adding sumac there for a seasoning, and then some of the usual suspects like the pineapple relish. But then they're turning it over a little bit and adding tahini sauce for that more of that Middle Eastern flair. Just a really craveable and unique way to do a plant-based uh, skewer instead of meat. And then back at Mason Yaki one more time, this is their spring leek and vichy soise. So your vichy soise is known for being that soup of leeks and potatoes and onions in that puree. And here they're putting it back uh, underneath that skewer of those leeks that have been lightly grilled with some really fine salt. Just a really d delicious way to enjoy uh, a vegetable skewer. And lastly, onto whip ricotta, these craveable clouds. Ricotta cheese is enjoying a renewed interest on the dining scene, but with a bit of a facelift morphing from the familiar curd to a new luxurious whip rendition. Its versatility was clearly evident in our research as chefs cross-utilized it for menu offerings spanning all the day parts, from dips and spreads to bowls and toasts, in dishes both sweet and savory. These creamy and comforting dishes possess wide appeal for dining consumers, 
making them potential new menu stars, not only in commercial food service, but the non-commercial food segment as well. Whipped ricotta is extremely versatile, and the luxurious texture you get from it is really simple to prepare. You put whole milk ricotta cheese into a food processor or a blender, and just spin it until the curds become a smooth puree. If you want to, you can add a little bit of olive oil to it to help the body of it, or you can add a little bit of uh, different sorts of fats like heavy cream or cream cheese to give it more texture or viscosity. And this is something that you could do, again, sweet or savory on your menu, has tons of applications from pizza toppings to schmears on toasts to tartines, uh, desserts, you name it. There's all different day parts here that you could find a place and cross utilize with ricotta cheese. Let's look at some of the best examples. This is restaurant S'more in New York City. And this is a s'more broad example, an open faced Scandinavian style toast. And here they're doing it with that whipped ricotta cloud on the top out of a pastry bag that zigzag back and forth there. They've got some really nice seasonal jam on top, some nice uh, French salt, and a little bit of herbs to give it that floral finish, a really unique way to do a toast. And then back at Flore, uh, you're gonna see a couple of versions of them, uh, a whipped ricotta here, which I appreciate because that's showing cross utilization. This is their fry bread. So they have their fry bread here, and they've got a dipping side of that whipped ricotta with nigella seeds uh, for texture and that flavor component. So Flore also does a filone or a different toast here, and this is their cross utilization, which I really appreciate. So you have your, your toast down, your sourdough, and then you've got uh, the whipped ricotta that goes across the, the top of it out of a pastry bag. You've got some different stone fruits, uh, some figs and some nectarines, and then some black pepper for a little bit of pungent spice uh, just to finish off the dish. But again, great way to take more of an app approach with the dip or the spread, and then cross utilizing that same ingredient for a filone or a toast, uh, more of a brunch rendition here. And then back to the Jones restaurateur Gabe Stolman in New York City. This is his newest concept again. You've got the whipped ricotta smeared alongside that bowl really artistically, and then you have uh, just some roasted delicata squash that goes down with some toasted sourdough bread. Really simplistic, but delicious, and there's genius in simplicity. Uh, Restaurant Margot in Los Angeles, this is a plan pan con tomate. So typically you would take the tomatoes and actually grate it over that crusty grilled bread to break it up. But here they're taking the whipped ricotta, they're putting in that side bowl and dish with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, and then putting that grated tomato right on top of that for that really nice dip. So a really unique way to do a pan con tomate. And at Restaurant Tartine, a bakery and cafe that's well known in Los Angeles area, here they have a, a warm dish of whipped ricotta that's got black pepper and olive oil. And again, you can pick one of their wonderful breads from the bakery that they have there to dip it in and enjoy. Restaurant Missy in Brooklyn, uh, Chef Missy Robbins, uh, newest restaurant. This is their charred marinated pepper dish with whipped ricotta. So again, this is on the savory side. Here you've got this uh, wonderful portion of three toasts with a mound cloud-like of whipped ricotta. And then just a plate up of charred peppers with marjoram uh, on the side that you can take and put on top of that crostini or that toast and take a big delicious bite of whipped ricotta and delicious peppers. And then lastly, this example is back at uh, restaurant Black Ship in Los Angeles. Uh, this is their Momotaro tomato dish. So you've got grilled bread on the side. And again, this is another dipping opportunity, another spread. You've got uh, house-made ricotta that's been whipped and spooned out instead of a pastry bag. And then again, this being that Italian-Japanese mashup concept, they've got the nori oil there with the seaweed, some Thai basil, some rice pearls for texture on top, and then some of that crusty bread again on the side for dipping. Now that we've reached the end of our Trends Insights, let's switch gears and talk about culinary strategies. We'll be utilizing some of our external research insights as a steady guide to paint a clear direction for your operations. So let's get started. As we look at our agenda, there are three main topics, menu flexibility, ghost kitchens, and my top 10 handhelds of 2020 for your portable inspirations. So let's take a look at a menu example from our latest Chicago research. This is restaurant The Bandit from Dynamic Hospitality Group, and what you are seeing in this menu is what we tasted in pre-pandemic times. In total, their menu has 24 items, but it is well organized. They pride themselves on offering nostalgic comfort food with global influences, and this is what consumers are attracted to today. Fast forward to present times, what does the track to recovery look like? Some backstory here. The Bandit is located in Chicago's restaurant row on Randolph Street. 
And when looking at their website, this pops up, instilling consumer confidence and directing where and what menus are available. With consumer confidence being so low today, I like their immediate call out on what they are doing to keep the health and safety of their customers the number one priority. The patio menu and portable food menu are almost identical with a few differences to call out. First, we have to acknowledge they shrunk their menu by more than 50%, but still kept in line with their brand and the items that they are known for. Additionally, their to-go menu through Caviar offers a pandemic picnic basket, which I appreciate for cross-merchandising what they already have in-house. And furthermore, their to-go menu has restricted a lot of the customizable opportunities it would normally offer for in-house dining which is smart after a three or four month hiatus from the kitchen crew in the back of the house. This is a great example of control what you can control, almost like rolling out a soft opening menu until you get some repetition from service. So a few menu callouts here that remain in their menus today from pre-COVID times. They are known for their disco fries, which is sort of an homage to poutine with global influence. So shout out to Canada. This is something that is unique that consumers can't get just anywhere and certainly will have difficulties trying to make this at home. A few things to note here. The first is that they didn't discount their price from then to now. So don't slash or discount your prices or it's a race to the bottom. Instead, they raised the price on their new menu from 14 to $16. The second thing is, this is a much better option to have opposed to a French fry for a portable solution since waffle or criss cut fries will better hold their texture, and that is what is being used as the vehicle here. This is their chicken shawarma salad, which is another menu item that remained, and for good reason. It is on trend with global or Mediterranean flavors that drive craveability, and salad options hit that healthy halo that dying consumers are looking for. It's extremely portable for to-goes, and lastly, it is a cold dish. Having that balance of cold to hot menu offerings are going to streamline kitchen production, alleviate labor pressures, and decrease ticket times. You can get ahead on cold items where most hot dishes are al minute or cooked to order. Next, their Diplomat Burger, which is another menu staple, is an appropriate call out here. One thing we know from our experience from the Great Financial Recession of 0809 is that there was a large increase in consumer demands for things like sandwiches and global flavors and comfort foods. This is a unique option that fits that bill. They take their house pull-apart Parker House rolls, they cut the tops off clean in one whole piece, and layer in mini griddle burgers, bacon jam, caramelized onion aioli, and Merck's cheddar spread. A great example of unique comfort food. On to ghost kitchens. So as consumer confidence slowly climbs back, ghost kitchens are becoming a viable option, and some people are predicting that it could be a large part of our industry sooner than later. They create less risk. This meaning less risk as it limits points of contact versus dine-in or patio service, and it's less financially risky for an operator than a full service brick and mortar restaurant. Ghost kitchens have zero front of the house costs and typically have a hyper-focused menu with heavy attention to the details of its craft. The cost per square foot is often dramatically less as savvy chefs and restaurateurs seek out spaces in suburbs of major cities or less sought after neighborhoods. They're designed to put out a consistent product quickly to streamline deliveries or in some cases, pickups. It is often self-marketed through only social platforms to avoid any further costs. And here is a great menu example from the Cream City Cluckery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is inside the new Pfizer Forum where the Milwaukee Bucks play. And they are starting to capitalize on the idea of this ghost kitchen investment. So what they did was they focused on what consumers want. They realized that there isn't any sort of fried chicken or a Chick-fil-A or anything of that nature available in that metro market downtown. So they decided to open up a ghost kitchen called Cream City Cluckery. If you look at their menu, it is very simplistic. They are really trying to drive, just capitalizing on great chicken tenders, quality of the product, not a lot of differentiation, but making it the best possible product they can. So you see a few different sides, some sauces, uh, different options for purchasing, and this is all coming through pickup or delivery. And then as far as the bucks go in Pfizer Forum, they're really pushing this out through social media as that driver to go ahead and get more foot traffic coming in for pickup or third-party delivery services. So you might be asking yourself right now, can I create a ghost kitchen? Josh Peters, as shown, is from the UK and has a large homegrown social media presence. 
himself and two of his friends launched a website for a fictitious restaurant called The Italian Stallion, listing his own apartment as the delivery address. After buying Instagram followers to bolster its social media presence, Josh went on to set up The Italian Stallion on Deliveroo, which is comparable to Grubhub here in the US. He would then buy prepackaged foods from the grocery store downstairs and reheat it in the microwave in his apartment, switch out the packaging and give it to the delivery driver who picked it up through Deliveroo. He refunded the customers in cash upon their food delivery and let them keep their meals just to see if it worked. So as you can see, maybe it's that simple. So maybe you're asking yourself, what day parts do I currently sell food in that maybe I could capitalize on the, on the latter? Perhaps there is an avenue for you to create a singular phenomenon that no one else is selling in your area. Maybe it's biscuits and gravy for breakfast or underground bagels with global cream cheese spreads. Think about what is lacking in your area and drive that demand. As previously mentioned, if we were to look at modern times in comparison to 2008, 2009, I would bet that sandwiches will see a large lift in purchases as it did in this graph. They are portable, economical, and can be a standalone meal for consumers. Let's take a look at my top 10 sandwiches of 2020 based off our research. This first sandwich comes from Bad Hunter in Chicago. It's the chicken fried hen of the woods sandwich. And literally, if I would eat this with my eyes closed, it tastes exactly like a fried chicken sandwich, but it's not, it's mushrooms. So they did an excellent job trying to mask that it's just a plant-based sandwich and really make it taste like chicken. They're breading it with a chicken breader. They're adding an Alabama white barbecue sauce to it. They have a house-made uh, hot sauce on the side. They've got your American cheese, all the kind of usual suspects you would find in a chicken sandwich, and a really, really nice soft brioche bun to put it all together. On to Bite Me in Los Angeles. This is their sole cheesesteak. It was huge for one, so really good value, but I really appreciated their kind of masked up, mashed up rendition here. So they have sliced ribeye, pasilla chilies, onions, provolone, and kimchi relish. So it's really mashed up. You've got pasilla and kimchi, so two different kind of global flavors, and then you have a cheesesteak, which is super American, right? So it's kind of this Korean, Hispanic mashup into this delicious kind of wrap of a sandwich, and it was just amazing. That's definitely one of my top favorites. Then on to Heroic Deli and Wine Bar in Santa Monica. This is their Artuzzi sandwich, and what I like about this is they're doing tuna three different ways. So they have pan-seared tuna that is rare, cured imported tuna, so your conserva, and then tonato sauce that goes in there as the dressing or the actual sauce for the sandwich. And tonato, if you're not familiar, is taking tuna conserva and essentially putting it into a blender with a mayonnaise or creating an emulsion to make that sauce. So it's tuna three ways here. And then they're adding roasted tomatoes, capers, caramelized fennel, and kalamata olives. Just a delicious sandwich. On to sibling rivalry in Los Angeles. This is another meatless option that I truly loved, and it's a rutabaga Reuben. Here they're treating that rutabaga really well, roasting it very carefully, making sure they slice it evenly to put down on the sandwich like it would be a piece of meat. But really, it's just the vegetable that's shining through here. They're adding the caraway mustard, the Thousand Island dressing, some sauerkraut, Alpine Swiss, and grilled rye. So all again, all the usual suspects you would find in a regular Reuben, but here they're switching out the meat for rutabaga instead. And this next example is from Mam Sur in Los Angeles, a new Filipino concept. This is their Longanisa sliders. So they're house-made pork sausage, ground with all their spices, a chara, some garlic mayo on a Hawaiian roll, and then they're pressing just their branded logo on top. But really what that does is give a little crispy counterpoint at the very top of that sandwich, almost like a pressed or griddled flatbread. And then Windrose in New York City, this is just a really fun play on chicken and waffles in a really big handheld to be, to be able to enjoy. And so what they're doing is they're taking their chicken thighs, their house bacon, obviously frying that chicken, making it really crispy and tender in the inside, and adding avocado, gojujang, so that Korean influence there, some house syrup, all on a waffle, which happens to be gluten-free, which I would not even realize it was that great and delicious. So all together, just a really, really great sandwich, uh, all comprised uh, on this plate. And then also in New York City is the Godiva Cafe. So this made my list because it was something that was completely unique. And this is what they're calling a crawfle. So they're crossed between a waffle and a croissant. And it is really simple to do. Uh, I've made them in, in, in the past after seeing this place and tasting the sandwich. But basically you're taking a baked croissant, slicing it in half, 
putting fillings inside there, putting it in a waffle iron and pressing it down. And the butter in the croissant comes out to the top and gets more and more caramelized and crispy. And it leaves those indents that the waffle iron makes like it would be making a waffle. So it's a pressed sandwich, but it's different and it's unique. And I think it's applicable for anybody to be able to put on a menu super easy and really no labor involved at all. So a delicious way to do a different take on a sandwich. This next example comes from East Stretto in Los Angeles, and this is their Il Papa. And parentheses in their menu, they call it their show pony, which I think is hilarious. But here they're adding mortadella and capicola, so kind of like your Italian hero. But then they're adding chorizo and manchego, which are Spanish flavors, some shredded lettuce, tomato, jardinera, dijonais, and then Calabrian chili spread for heat. I mean, this sandwich had so much going on, so much flavor, so much umami from the cured sausage and the cheese that's in there. It was just really delicious and had tons and tons of flavor. And then at Olenstein in New York City, this is a Danish uh, fast casual concept that has a lot of open face sandwiches or smorbroads and a tremendous amount of delicious pastries. But this sandwich I thought was just delicious in itself. I mean, it's really a knife and fork kind of a deal as an open face, but it is a roasted chicken with creme fraiche. It's got celery root that's been roasted on there, some kale pesto, gives it a tremendous amount of color, the delicata squash, and the pumpkin seeds for texture. I mean, I think this is a, a really, really good opportunity for anybody to showcase a fall dish as we're in right now. And uh, very minimal investment as far as the cost to build this sandwich, but still tons of flavor and also that healthy halo kind of shining through with it as well. And then at Birdie G's, Chef Jeremy Fox in Santa Monica, this is uh, his Texas toast. He has a menu section he's calling Texas toast, but they're not what you think it is. It is literally open faced toast uh, on a thick cut brioche. And here he's doing one with chicken liver mousse, which I just love. So he's got caramelized onions, Manischewitz jam. He's got the mousse down. He's got crispy onion straws there on the left and in the right, just a little bit of allium or more chives there sprinkled through. So again, another knife and fork deal, but so much flavor and a different approach to toast that I've never seen before. And certainly something from Texas toast I've never seen either. And that concludes this seminar. So hopefully you found some value and inspirations to take with you along the way. So thank you again for attending and be sure to go to Ask the Experts area on this virtual food show to fill out a survey on this presentation and all the time that you have spent here on the show site and also to acquire your continuing education credits. On behalf of the Gordon Food Service family, thank you for your business. And if we're a prospect on your radar, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Have a great day.